My name is Harry Kleiner and I'm an Associate Professor at the School of Engineering and IT at UNSW in Canberra. One of the main areas of my research is to make invisible, otherwise invisible flows visible. And to do that, I design and build optical setups that can make those flows visible. The principle behind set, these setups has been actually known for a long time, and that is that the speed of light depends on the density of the medium that this light propagates through. This transparent object could be the hot air of the plume above a lighter. It could also be the warm air above your hand, or it could be a, a sheet of glass. The thickness of this glass is by no means constant, but there are actually quite a few ripples in this. A lot of laboratories all over the world have such visualization systems and even our campus here has already three of them. One of them is the setup that you can see here that's in the supersonic tunnel lab and we use this to make supersonic flows and flows in a shock tube visible. Another setup is used at the hypersonic shock tunnel and a third one with a laser spark facility. Each of these systems look, they don't, they look different but they're all really based on the same design principles. The setup we have here in the supersonic lab has evolved over many years into what it is right now and it allows us to change between different methods without too much change of any hardware and we can also use two methods or possibly three at the same time to visualize the same flow. This clip here shows the difference between looking at an object through with a naked eye or through a Schlieren system. What you see here is a bullet that flies from the right to the left and what you see here on this side is just the bullet but once it enters the visualization system you will also see the wake and the leading shock wave. Both the wake and the shock waves are exist, they exist here as well but here on this side you can't see them. Most research applications in which such a system is being used involve some sort of a high-speed tunnel because high-speed flows are a prime example of those Object, transparent objects that change density. But you can also use this for other and probably even more everyday life uh, type examples. This here, for example, is the, uh, the gas that sort of comes out of a fizzy drink bottle once you open it. You could also watch a popping balloon and see how the gas inside the balloon stays for a while while the shell of the balloon is actually shrinking at a much faster pace. In wind tunnels we can use those optical systems to investigate the aerodynamics of flying objects and one of the liberties we have is that we don't have to restrict this to existing aircraft but we could also look at flying machines from fiction if only to see if they could actually fly. One of the applications where the visualization is almost your only instrument in understanding the physics of a flow is shown here. This is a shockwave that comes from the left to the right and that is reflected by this shape over here. And this reflected wave focuses somewhere here, concentrating most of the energy that the shock had at its original, in its original state in a very small area. One of the questions is how efficient is this focusing? In fact, this interesting figure that you see over here is that this particular reflector is not very efficient because in an efficient reflector there would have been just a single spot and not too many of these other disturbances over there. This is one way to use such an optical system to find out whether a particular physical process can be run in an efficient way. In a different application, we can also make visible the loading that a structure would be exposed to when it is hit by a blast wave. So we have here, from the left, a shock wave that runs, uh, passes over a pillar and the pillar is located in front of a wall. So the shock wave will first negotiate the pillar and then be reflected from the wall. And uh, all of those, the colors that you see here can be directly related to a value of density. And if you evaluate this, you will find out that the biggest load on the pillar actually comes from the wave that is rebounding, that is coming back from the wall. And uh, methods like this are standard in standard ways used in situations where you want to see how shock waves or blast waves propagate around obstacles. Another thing that one can answer with the help of visualization is that in the case of an explosion, what comes at you first? Is it the blast wave or are those possibly the fragments of the container that have held the explosive? The possibly slightly 
uh, unsatisfying answer is that it depends. It's not a clear-cut answer. It depends on the explosive and on the fragments. In this particular case here, we had uh, the fragments clearly outrunning the explosive or the, the blast wave of the explosion. In this case, on the other hand, we will can see here's our blast wave, and there's a, a particle that actually penetrates the blast wave, and that is part of the fra a fragment that sort of is there before the blast front arrives. On the other hand, further down here is a particle that just tries to penetrate the blast front but doesn't succeed. So in this case, for that part, the blast front gets up uh, is is there faster. And that depends on the shape and on the drag that the that this fragment is uh, being is, is generating, and of course on the on the local speed of the blast wave. So that's just another example of uh, what you could probably not find out with a technique other than a high-speed visualization, as the one shown here. One of the most thrilling and rewarding aspects of this work is that you get to see something that is normally invisible and that nobody else has seen before you. And that is, to this very day, extremely fascinating and also can be a lot of fun.